this was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves. He's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody yells, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Yep. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to The Confessionals. I am your host, Tony Merkel. Thank you for being here. If you've had an encounter or a story you'd like to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. That's theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the contact section, and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me. Just get a hold of me. And if you want more shows on a weekly basis on every Thursday, we release a special episode for members only to the website. So if you want to get more episodes on the website, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button and become a member today. Now we got a great show planned for you today. In fact, we have a great day planned for you today. We are launching Hammer Lane Legends right now. As you are listening to me speak, there is Hammer Lane Legends waiting for you to go listen. And we are dropping two episodes today on the launch day. There is one episode waiting, and then right after that, there's a second episode waiting. And the second episode waiting is actually the guest that you're going to hear right now in the confessionals. You see, Sam contacted me and told me he had some dramatic experiences from being a civilian driver for our military in Iraq. And he came on Hammer Lane Legends to talk about his wild experiences overseas. In fact, it was one of the top three interviews I have ever done. It was that good. So you definitely want to go ahead and check out Hammer Lane Legends when you're done listening to this episode. But now we're going to be actually talking to Sam again about his paranormal experiences. He and his wife came home one night and saw a rake in their neighbor's yard. He actually had a Bigfoot experience and other hat man experiences as well. Sam brings all those stories to the table today. And speaking of Hat Man, we have officially launched another scent called Hat Man for beard oils and beard balms. So guys, if you're digging the scents that we're coming out with the beard oils and beard balms, I promise you, you're really going to enjoy the Hat Man scent as well. It is for sale right now on the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the stores button and you'll see the Hat Man scents right there waiting for you guys to order if you so choose. Now, Now, let's get to Sam and talk to him about his rake experience, his Bigfoot experience, and his hat man experience. And when we're done with Sam, hop on over to Hammer Lane Legends and hear him again talking about the absolutely wild stories he has from driving truck in Iraq. All right, welcome to the show, everybody. I have a special guest with me today, and it's my dad. Dad, how you doing? All right, how about yourself? I'm doing fine, I'm doing fine. So uh, we just got done doing an interview with, a well, 
One of the most amazing stories I have ever heard in my entire life. No kidding. Uh, this was something that you would think you just went to the movie theater. You know how when you go into a movie theater and you watch one of these amazing movies and you walk out just like feeling weird? Yeah. You had that weird feeling. You're walking down the weird uh, hallway in a movie theater out to your car and you just feel like you don't want to leave the movie theater because you're that emotional about what you just saw. Yeah. That's exactly how I felt about this interview. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's it, it like honestly was one of the most um, influential, dramatic, uh, heartfelt conversations I've ever had. And so uh, we actually have him again as a guest for this show. Sam, how you doing, man? Good. I'm good, Tony. It's good to be back with you. Absolutely. So, Sam, I know you just heard what we said, and I, I really do mean it. Like your story that you just shared on Hammerlane Legends is one of the most fascinating, dramatic, heartfelt, amazing, speechless. Like, do, I don't even have the right words to say. I don't think there's vocabulary to cover it. I really don't. Yeah. I, I, that's how awe inspiring it is. It is just one of those jaw dropping moments where you are riveted to the story. You yeah. are listening without a pause. You don't want it to end. Right. Exactly. And so, Sam, you uh, just so the audience understands what we're talking about, uh, you were a civilian truck driver in Iraq. And what that means, and I didn't know what that meant until you told me. But what that means is you're literally an American citizen that volunteered to go to Iraq and drive truck for the military, hauling things such as fuel, which is what you did a lot of, right? That's right. I, I hauled jet fuel and gasoline for three years all over Iraq. And so the audience understands you're not just hauling like um, a straight truck of a small little tanker truck around. You were hauling 100,000 pounds of fuel through Iraq, through enemy territory with bombs going off around you, people shooting at you, literally an entire nation trying to kill you every time you drove those roads. And you shared those stories on Hammerlane Legends. And it was honestly a pleasure to talk to you about that stuff. And one of the most riveting stories and experiences I think I probably will ever hear in my entire life. And again, man, I just want to say thank you very much for doing that. And you had told me that you had other paranormal experiences that you thought you could share on the confessionals. And you told me what they were. And I was like, well, <laughs> absolutely. So I figured <laughs> let's run it back. And we took a 30 minute break. And here we are. Uh, back in studio and I'm being accompanied. J Dad, by the way, yeah. you're the very first person that has ever co-hosted on this show. Well, it is an honor. Nobody's ever done that before. And That's so, really cool. Yeah. And uh, we're going to have Sam sharing his paranormal experiences as well now on the confessionals. Sam, you and your wife both saw a rake going through your yard. And we're not talking about a garden rake. We're talking about a monster. So if you could... Please share with us what happened. Well, that's that's right, Tony. We we live right in Blackfoot, Idaho, right in town. Our, we have neighbors, you know, within 50 feet on each side of our house. And we came home late from a movie one night. And as we turned into our driveway, it was on the neighbor's property, but it was sitting and watching our house. And we turned in and the lights caught it and we, it didn't register with either one of us. And we parked the car and I, I said, what was that? And my wife said, I, I don't know. And the first thing I thought it was, I thought it was our neighbor naked outside sitting on his lawn <laughs> and cause your mind just doesn't register what it, what it could be. And then we live in town, but animals will come up the river and we neighbors have had mountain lions or moose in their yards. And, and then I thought maybe that was a, a mountain lion that was sitting there. And, and I thought it couldn't, it couldn't be a mountain lion. It wasn't right. And what I saw was this thing was sitting on its haunches like a dog would, but its knees were up by its ears. And its hands were flat on the ground and it was real skinny, skinnier than it should have been. 
and and just from the the proportions I told you, the the knees up by its head, that doesn't fit anything that I can I can think of. And we didn't see it. It turned its head and looked at us as we pulled in, but I backed up and shined the lights back there, and it was gone. So we never saw it move, but we did. Both of us saw it sitting there, and we, for years, didn't know what it was. And then I heard you talking to a gentleman in Texas who talked about seeing some rakes. I think they were running on the, he was driving down the road and saw him running, but that piqued my interest and I looked it up and that the, the different artist conceptions and stuff that you see online is exactly what we saw. So I always wonder when I hear people talk about the rake, are they seeing what, I think of as the rake. And if you're saying to me that what you saw is what, you know, I put a video up about, I don't know if you saw that video on YouTube of the rake sightings. I took a compilation of videos and put a, made a vi big video about it just so people could see what I'm talking about when I say rake. Uh, that's what you're saying you saw? Yeah, that's what we saw. Big black eyes, uh, the human shape, but out of proportion and really skinny and all one color. It was all, uh, besides the eyes, it was all a real light leathery looking, uh, skin and texture to it and no clothes or anything like that. Just, just that skin and that light kind of rough texture. I get like a, like a leather, leathery skin over the whole thing yeah and that's what i was just gonna say i was gonna ask you if it was like leathery skin what did you feel on the inside when you saw this thing i mean was it a sense of fear or more confusion well we were we were both confused we we talked about it what it could be and we've talked about it several times since since we saw it and we like i said we had no idea what it was everything that we category that we tried to put it in it didn't fit we knew that you know we'd come up with an idea maybe it was this and then you'd immediately dismiss it because it, it didn't fit what we saw until i saw different uh renditions of that online different uh what there and i heard people describe it and then we and then we said well that's it was an aha moment. That's exactly what we saw. That is frightening. And what makes it doubly frightening is that it was in your neighbor's yard looking at your house when you came home. I mean, I don't know yeah. what I would do if that was me. I, I don't know if I, if I would just back the car out of the driveway and go to a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I don't mean to, you know, it, it, it just, it's just, it's so frightening to think about that. That is really, that's well, a frightening. I and I just got goosebumps remembering it. Oh, I, and, I can imagine. And I'm hoping that where it was sitting on the neighbor's property looking at our house, that it wouldn't cross a property line. But that's just me hoping that, you know, I hope it's the neighbors and they keep it over there. <laughs> I hear that. You know, uh, with it looking at your house and stuff, did it, was it looking at your ho house with intent or, you know how like sometimes you see a dog and you're driving down the road and you see a dog sitting in a yard, just kind of looking around aimlessly and just get the sense that the dog has nothing better to do, but to sit in the front lawn and just watch cars go by. Or was it sitting there staring at your house with intent, almost as if it was planning a next move? It, it was pretty intense. It, and we had, we had some chickens in the backyard and I always thought, well, if it was a mountain lion, maybe it was sitting there just looking at the chicken intently, you know, cause that's the impression it gave me, but, but it wasn't a mountain lion. There's no mistake in that. It was, and I don't know if it was watching those chickens. I like to think that and not making a move, thinking of what it was going to do to the people in the house. But yeah, it was pretty intense. Have you ever noticed anything weird missing or chickens missing or anything like that, that would, you know, be a sign of unusual activity outside of seeing this thing? No, we've never had any chickens missing. I I grew up on a farm and ranching, and horses have been a big part of my life. We we were taught to take care of your horses, and they'd take care of you. And I woke up one night, 
and the neighbors had some horses in a pasture behind us. And those horses were screaming. I've never heard a horse make a noise like that. And I, I thought, I woke up, and I thought something is killing those horses. And then I went back to bed, where my whole life, I, my reaction would be to get a rifle and shoot whatever's uh, chasing the horses or scaring the horses, which I've done. I've, I've shot dogs out of that have been chasing horses and stuff. It's just what you do when you grow up around here. And, and I, I still can't believe that I woke up and said, I've never heard horses scream like that. Something's killing those horses. And then I went, went right back to bed. So I can't, I can't explain that. I don't know what it was. Were there horses dead then? No, they weren't dead. I did see a, they'd been run. You can tell when a horse has been run hard and, and those horses had been worked up quite a bit, but they, they weren't dead or anything like that. But that's just the impression I got when I heard the noises they were making. And where in the country is this man? I don't think we've said that on the show. I live in Blackfoot, Idaho. Idaho is a, one of the most mountainous states in the entire United States. We have the biggest primitive wilderness in the entire, in the lower 48, except for Alaska, you know, outside of Alaska, we have the biggest primitive wilderness area. And I actually live right <clears throat> across the river from a Indian reservation. So less than a mile where my house is from the Indian reservation, as soon as you cross that river, you're on the reservation. So there, I don't know if that has a connection, just a, a fact. Maybe. I mean, you know, you hear about the different things with the Native Americans and their their legends, like uh, the Skinwalker and Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, the native, the native police, they know about Skinwalker Ranch and they know about the Skinwalkers and they very much accept it and they very much know it's real and they tell people it's real. And so um, not saying what you saw was a skinwalker, but the idea is that, you know, maybe it was. You never know. I mean, you, you just don't know. Uh, and being that close to native land, it's just weird things happen on Native American property. And I, I, I don't totally understand why. I don't know if it's I don't know if it's uh, the, the idea of it being protected land or maybe it being the people or combination uh, I, I don't know, but they have wild stories and a lot of it happens on their lands. And it's very fascinating to me and probably terrifying for them. But uh, dad, what do you think? I, I think it's fascinating. I do. I, and I don't know why. I, I agree with you. I, I, there's, there's nothing I, I can explain to it that, that makes it sound like it's it makes any sense. But yeah, it does seem to be that there's a lot of, of this type of activity centered around Native American lands. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I I don't know, man. And the rake is one of those things that just, it's always a head scratcher for me. It's like, it's one of those things where you don't know what it is, but you know it when you see it. And yeah. Yeah, like, exactly. I mean, exactly. we have no idea what this rake is. I mean, we could say Bigfoot's a giant monkey or it's a Nephilim. We could say ghosts or demons. We could say ghosts are spirits of your dead uncle and aunts and, and all this stuff we can say. But when it comes to rakes, the only thing we could say is i don't know alien maybe i don't know but they're scary and the sounds it, the sounds they make are terrifying it's scary and i i i'm just glad that other people have seen it because i i wouldn't have words for it and i would still be a mystery if i if other people hadn't seen it and that kind of lets me know that i'm not not crazy you know yeah, Sam, knowing your life story that you share with us on Hammerland Legends, that's a common thing that you come across, isn't it? Uh, trying to confirm that you're not crazy. That's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, really, man, I, I, like, it's just, wow. Uh, so, Sam, talk to me about the uh, the Sasquatch stories that you have. Is this something that you experience personally or a family member or what? So I, <clears throat> I have one story that is myself, and that kind of piqued my interest and i've i've collected stories from people i know who i've talked to personally and we live idaho's all mountainous like i said except for the southern part 
all the way across the state is the Snake River Plain. And next to the Snake River, you'll have all the agriculture. And then out away from that is lava rock and desert. Uh, the Craters of the Moon, where the astronauts trained, is, is actually in this part of the desert where I'm talking about. And there's been a long history of Bigfoot in this area. I know out in the desert, there was two cowboys back in the 1800s that supposedly roped a wild hairy man and brought him into town. And Teddy Roosevelt, do you know the story, the Bowman story of Teddy Roosevelt about the two trappers and one of them got killed? I sure do. But if you want to give the audience a synopsis, go right for it. So that they were in a part of the wilderness that they hadn't been trapped before. And they got up up there. They found a good spot, set out all their traps, but they noticed that something was messing with their camp every night. And this got more and more intense. And long story short, one of them ended up getting killed and he'd been bit in the back of the neck and the other trapper came onto camp and found his body and all the human looking footprints around. And he could tell being a, a mountain man and being able to read the sign that whatever had killed him had rolled around on top of him and thrown dirt up in the air and just was joyful that he'd finally killed this person. Well, that trapper told this story to Teddy Roosevelt and he wrote it in one of his books. And that happened in the mountains just up not far from where I live. And those mountains come down, the canyons come down and and spread out on this desert that I'm talking about now. And it's interesting that up in those mountains, I know several people who have told me they've shot deer and seen them fall. They know they hit them hard and go over there and the deer's gone. They can't find it. And people that have been camping there, whether they were hunting or, or wrapped in the river, that have heard rocks being thrown, huge rocks thrown into the river at night and, and the screams and the noises that you associate with Bigfoot. So all this kind of spreads out onto the desert and that's where my incident happened. I was, I like to go out on the desert and look for old Indian artifacts, the Oregon Trail went through there, a, a leg of it, and I'll go metal detect that and see what I can find. And at night, I'll just pull my pickup up to a fence post and tie a hammock from one from the fence post to my pickup, and that's where I'll sleep at night. And I was doing that one night asleep out there, and it started to rain. So I rolled the hammock up, threw it in the toolbox of the pickup, and I was in the front seat of the pickup. I laid the seat back and was sleeping. And I had a really mean big dog that always hung out with me. And he was in the passenger seat. <clears throat> well, I I woke up and the rain had stopped, and the clouds had gone away, and the, there was a bright moon out. And you can see really good out there at night when when it's a uh, full moon or almost full moon and my dog was looking out my window the driver's side window and he was growling a real low growl and I put my hand up in front of his face and he never even looked at me he just moved his head so he could keep watching what was behind me out that window and I turned and looked and I was on the edge of a butte and then there was a flat area like a prairie for about 200 yards. And then the lava rocks started right there. And something was walking from those lava rocks towards the pickup where I was at. And that's what my dog had seen. And that's what he was watching and what he was growling at. And every, every hair on that dog was standing up all along his back and his neck. And, and mine was too, after I saw what, what was out there and I, it was bright enough that I could see the outline of it because it had hair 
and the the brightness of the moon was illuminating that outline. You could see the hair around it, and it was on two legs, just like a person, and it was walking towards me in my pickup. And I, I got, I was scared. I didn't know what it was. <clears throat> and I turned on the pickup and backed up so that the, it was facing this, whatever was out there. And I turned the headlights on and it was gone. I never, never saw it again after that. So that, that's my story. I, I can't say a hundred percent that it was a big foot, but then when I, Compare that with other stories I've heard from that area. I'm I'm pretty positive that's what it was. Yeah. So I mean, you you see this thing and it's walking towards your truck in that moment. I imagine your mind is running a million miles an hour in that moment. Did you think Sasquatch or were you just not comprehending what you were seeing? I wasn't sure what it was at first. I I just was a uh, kind of kind of didn't know what to think what to think because this this is out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, you take water, you take, if anything happens, you're on your own. There's no cell service. There's nothing out there. And the chances that a person would be walking up on a truck out in the middle of the night, that's just ridiculous. But then I could see the outline of the hair around the edges of, and it looked gray. And so I didn't, I didn't say Sasquatch right away. I just, that wasn't my first thought. My first thought wasn't Sasquatch. I, I just knew that something big that shouldn't be there was walking towards me while I was asleep out there. Yeah. Well, it sounds scary, man. It really sounds scary. But what do you think? Dad? <laughs> I was just going to say to wake up and see that to wake up coming out of a sleep. <laughs> <laughs> not, it's not like you're sitting there awake, paying attention to what's going on around you. And all of a sudden you see this, but you wake up out of your sleep. I mean, that is, that's just frightening. That is just that is just downright frightening, and I would think the same thing. I'd be like, "What in the world is that?" And then I would start my truck and I would back it up and I would, you know, be ready to to go if I need to get if I need to go. But yeah, that's it. That, that, that's exactly what I would think. I mean, you, yeah. you know, you you're coming out of a sleep. You're coming out of, you know, unconsciousness, and waking up into consciousness and seeing this is just got to be frightening. Well, and it it took me up so much that I. I was planning on being out there for a couple of days and I, I drove home. It was two or three in the morning and I, I just drove two hours home. I, I was, wasn't interested in staying out there anymore after seeing that. Yeah, that's totally understandable. I, I, would, I would have packed up shop too, uh, especially knowing that the dog saw it too. The dog was pretty uh, bothered by it. Let's just yeah. say that. Because you never know with a dog, with the hair standing up, are they planning on being aggressive or is it more fear? But uh, it definitely saw what you saw. And that's enough for me to book it for sure. How yeah. how big would you estimate this to be? I know it's probably hard because of being so dark out and stuff. But I mean, weight wise, height wise, what would you say? Well, I'd, yeah, it would be hard to estimate. But I know that area really well. I know exactly how far away it was because I've I've walked out there hundreds of times, but he, it would, it would be taller than I was probably. I wouldn't think it was huge, like, like seven or eight feet tall, but I think it was over six feet tall and, and really, uh, thick through the shoulders. And I, I wouldn't guess it away, but, but over six feet tall, thick through the top and then kind of slimmer on the bottom as it walked. And it, it almost seemed like it was gliding as it walked across there. It wasn't up and down like a person. It seemed to glide across the ground as it walked towards me. Yeah. Well, that's a common uh, thing that people describe is the way they, they walk. Uh, a lot of people say that they, they, it seems like it's just effortless, just kind of, like you said, gliding. Uh, yeah. Now you said you, you packed up shop. You went, you left, you were gone. Did you ever go back? Yeah. I've been back several times. I <clears throat> not as anxious to stay out there at night as I used to be, but if there's somebody with me, I, I will, but not as often as I used to, but I still go out to that area quite a bit. 
Have you ever noticed any signs of Bigfoot activity outside that initial sighting? I mean, obviously footprints. I mean, if you saw footprints, please say so. But like, you know, like they talk about the tree structures and uh, weird bends and trees, things like that. I mean, I'm sure you've heard it before, but have you ever seen anything that would lead to you believing that there could be something out there than that one time? Like, say you never saw what you saw. Would you have ever seen anything that would say, huh, maybe this is a uh, Bigfoot territory? No. And, and this is all, this is all sagebrush, you know, maybe, maybe just above knee high and, and lab rock. So there's, there, you wouldn't see a lot of tree structures or anything like that. But if you get out in those lab rocks, there's tunnels, there's caves that I am positive nobody's ever even been in. So, and there's miles and miles of it. And I, I believe that something could stay out there indefinitely and no one would ever know it was out there. So as far as sign and footprints, I have never seen anything like that. The the thing that convinces me is the other stories I've heard from people out there. I had a good friend who was asleep in the, he was deer hunting and he was asleep in the back of his pickup and he woke up to a, a gray face looking at him over the side of his pickup and he said it was all the stories i've heard out there are are gray that this animal's gray and he woke up and this thing was looking over the side of his pickup looking at him and when he said he he sat straight up and the it, it scared it and it took off through the desert but he sat there and watched it in the moonlight running away from his truck and watched it till it, till it ran out in the lava rocks and, and disappeared out there. Wow. I mean, talk about a scary situation. Jeez. Yeah. I don't know if he just <clears throat> likes creeping on people that are sleeping out there, but that's, that seems to be a lot of the stories that are like that. Like my friend woke up and he was, looking at him over the side of the pickup or I was asleep and caught him coming up towards the pickup. That's kind of a common theme. I did have another story out in that same area and there was three girls who were going to the university and they were by biology majors and they would go out every night and they would drop one girl off and then drive maybe a mile away, drop the second girl off and then drive. <clears throat> the third girl would drive with the pickup and they would wait there till it got dark and they would count bats. And that was their project was counting how many bats they saw in a certain area over a, a period of time. And they said that they were doing their same routine that they always did in the same area and dropped the first girl off and she saw something coming out of the lab rocks out of the sagebrush and it got close enough and it was, it was a gray Bigfoot. And she started walking to the second girl who was almost a mile away. And this thing followed her watching her the whole way. This, she got to the second girl, the second girl saw it and they walked to the third girl who had the pickup. And this thing followed them the whole way, and all three of them saw it, and all three of them said that they all saw the same thing out there. Gray, gray Bigfoot wasn't really big, just a little over six feet. It wasn't a, a huge monster like some of them that you hear, but always gray. That's the the common theme. They're always gray. What do you make of that? I mean, the idea that it's always gray. Do you think it's just one Bigfoot out there flying solo? Do you think it's uh, maybe like a, a pack of these things that just are all gray? Or do you think that maybe it is a pack that has one guy that's in there gray and he's the idiot that keeps getting caught by the humans <laughs> seeing him? Like, he's he's the daredevil. He's the one that is the sucker. It's like, hey, you're, you're lowest rank and file here. You go across the road, distract them so we can get away. I don't know. I, I, I've always, <clears throat> since it was in the same area, I always had the impression maybe it was the same one. And the, 
you always hear about the, you know, when they get busted like that, doing stupid stuff, but it seems like it's the younger ones and maybe where this one isn't real big. And this all happened within a couple of years of each other. And maybe where he wasn't real big and like some of them are known to be that maybe he was a young one that just, just was out there being curious and, and got busted a couple of times. Yeah. Well, you know, that makes sense. That does make sense. And, uh, I, I withdraw any suggestions I've had private prior to what you just said, because I think that's probably more likely than anything. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. It makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. I think so too. Well, case solved. So next one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would like to tell you that I worked for a guy who would run cows out on the desert in the springtime. He had a BLM lease and then in the summer, he'd take them up in the mountains. But he, he lost a bunch of calves one year in the spring out on the desert. And some of them, they'd find the calves had been partially eaten. And some of them, the calves would just disappear and they would never know what happened to them. And he called the fishing game, the Idaho fishing game to come out and, and see what was, what was going on. And they said it was probably coyotes. And this is the thing that I found super interesting is that fish and game officer came out and he played a recording of monkeys fighting on a loudspeaker to, and then started counting how many coyotes he heard. And I, I thought, what in the hell is the Idaho fish and game officer playing recordings of monkeys fighting? And how does he know that that's going to rile those coyotes up like that? Because you hear all these stories, like on, on your show, I've heard them, and Wes's show about coyotes and, and following the Bigfoot around and just making a racket like, like you've never heard before. And I thought, here's a, here's a government official that knows to play a recording of monkeys fighting so that he can count the coyotes up there. Yeah, well, that doesn't doesn't that kind of tip your hat a little bit off to the idea that there's more to these things than uh, they want to admit? I mean, if it was just a superstition, then why would why would you do that? I mean, maybe you know there is another way to think about it, where it's just like, you know, I don't know the 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 officer heard from somebody an old timer that just so happened somehow he was in his truck listening to monkey music and and, <laughs> and the monkeys were going off and the coyotes came out of the woods and started howling and that's how they connected all the dots but in all reality how do you connect the dots of monkeys fighting that attracts coyotes without actually having some kind of idea that that might do it before you play it on audio you know what i mean like, like how do you connect exactly. those dots until you know but if you're connecting the dots because, hey, we got Sasquatch in the area, and though we don't have recordings of Sasquatch, we have recordings of monkeys fighting. Let's play that and see if it gets the coyotes route up. Now we're talking. Now we're talking about yeah. something that might be heading somewhere. Just a, That was just a coincidence. I, I thought that that was too much to be a coincidence. So it, I thought it was odd. Oh, definitely odd. It's definitely odd. I mean, is it concrete? No. But I mean, it's definitely odd. It's something to uh, consider and just kind of turn your head sideways at and say, huh. So uh, talk to me about this shadow man that you saw when you were a kid. So I grew up in a, a real religious home and I still am. And I'm glad I grew up that way. It's helped me through my entire life. But when I was in fourth grade, there was some kids at school who made a Ouija board just out of a piece of notebook paper. And I had no idea what that was. I had no idea that I should stay away from it. And they told me how it worked in a recess. We would, you know, try to make it work and only did that a couple times. But I went home one night and went to sleep and I woke up and the room was black, but in the corner, by the closet was a, a figure that was blacker than the rest of the room. And he was standing there watching me. He was across the room. I was on one side. He was on the other. And he had a hat on 
it wasn't a top hat. It was like a fedora, but with the big, bigger brim. And all this is an outline because I couldn't see any details or anything. It was just darker than the rest of the room. And he had a cape on that came off his shoulders and went down to just above his knees or to his knees. And he stood there and watched me. Even after I woke, after I woke up and was watching, saw him he stood there and watched me and that scared me so bad my dad worked shift work and he he would always fall asleep upstairs in front of the tv and i went up and slept on the couch in the living room where he was at i felt safer there and that happened right before school let out for the summer and i was so scared to sleep in my room that I didn't go back and sleep in my room until school started the next after summer was over. So it was months before I would go in my room when it was dark after I saw that. And I believe that it was connected to or had something to do with, with the fact that those idiots had a Ouija board and, and we would mess around with it when I was at school. Did you ever ask any of the kids if they had a similar experience? No, I didn't. And I, to be honest, I couldn't even tell you who those kids were. They weren't the normal kids who I hung out with or anything. I just happened to get uh, interested in what they were doing. And and for those couple times, uh, hung out with them when they did that. But I couldn't even tell you their names now. I don't remember who they were. Yeah, it's interesting, man. It definitely is interesting. You, uh, you told me about this experience before we went live, and uh, you didn't give me all the details. And I said, "Hat man." My dad said, "No." He said, "Shadow man." You had a hat man experience, bro. <laughs> That's what it was. I mean. The the hat man is a is a top hat or a fedora. A lot of times they're described wearing a cape. I mean, that's what you saw, man. Like that's a, exactly what I saw. And it was it was almost cartoonish it, in the the way it the way it was. If it, if it wasn't so scary, it would be almost uh, ridiculous that I saw it. But I but I saw it. You know, it's funny. I I've never heard a story with a happy ending that starts out. We got a Ouija board out. Yeah. <laughs> it never, exactly. it's never a good. I, I think to myself, all these times that you hear these stories, and you're like, why? <laughs> Have you ever heard a good story <laughs> that is, you know what I mean? A happy ending story. I mean, it's yeah. a good story, but a happy ending. Right. You know, something that worked out well with a Ouija board. I just have, <laughs> I've never heard one. <laughs> well, and I, and like I said, I grew up in a religious household and I, I think, why didn't my parent? why didn't I know about that? Why didn't they tell me to stay away from that? But I wish they would have. Well, now you're getting into my territory of how <laughs> I feel about these things. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. I don't think that the American church takes the supernatural as serious as it should. I don't think that the American church in 2020, as we record this, uh, believes in the supernatural God as it is in the Bible. Therefore, I don't think that they see Ouija boards as uh, any more than a superstition that people tell scary stories around it, it's it's all just a joke and uh you know hey listen you can buy a ouija board in in walmart so therefore it can't be real right i mean right we've been so numb and and dumbed down on a spiritual level when it comes to this stuff uh, I'm not talking about a Christian level or anything like that. I'm just saying a spiritual, we're spiritual beings. All of us are spiritual beings. No matter what your beliefs are, we're spiritual beings. And we've been dumbed down in this realm to believe that there is no spiritual being and there is no nothing that we can do to affect a spiritual being because there is none. Uh, it, it, I'm telling you, dude. Uh, and it's not like your parents' fault per se. It's just no. the environment and the culture that we have all migrated towards in this country. We have moved away from accepting the reality that there's something else outside of this physical body that we have. And it's 
it, it, it's evident every time I talk to somebody anymore. <laughs> and so, I mean, uh, I've said it before, so I'll just, uh, I'll wrap it up on that one. <laughs> if I go any further, well, I, I might get some emails. <laughs> yeah, I, I tend to agree with you with the experiences I've had and everything. I, I take, when I read the Bible, I take it a lot more literal than I used to, mm-hmm. which I think is a good thing. I think we, we kind of shut that off and brush it under the rug, but to our, our detriment. Most definitely. Most definitely. So, Sam, man, you had this rake experience with your wife, which is probably comforting to know that you actually saw it with somebody that saw it because it, it really does keep you from thinking that you're crazy. And uh, because that's really, you know, I mean, like a rake is really like it's not Sasquatch or everybody and their grandma has had a Sasquatch experience. Right. I mean, we have so many. But uh, when you're out here doing what I do and stuff, I don't come across a whole lot of rake stories. So people who come across a rake, uh, they probably think that they're just crazy. So hopefully more people hear your story and they they, uh, you know, come forward and share their story. But you have this rake experience with your wife and you have the Sasquatch experience with the dog. Uh, you have the hat man experience and you also have a UFO experience. What happened with this? Well, <clears throat> I don't know if you're familiar with the, the how they irrigate builds out, out in this part of the country, but they have a center pivots, which will have a fill that's maybe a hundred acres and it'll have a, a pivot point in the middle and then a sprinkler that walks around it. And they're 12, 13 feet tall. They're, they're pretty big, and they walk around the field, and that's how they irrigate the field. So I, one morning, I pulled up to one, a field to check. You got to check, make sure everything, everything's running the way it should. And right over the center of that pivot, I was on the edge of the field, and right over the center of that pivot was a, a UFO. And I had to look twice. I I saw it, and I put the truck in reverse and started to back up. And I thought, what is that? And I put the truck in park, and I look again. Because your mind just doesn't register that. You, something that it's never seen. And it, when I realized what I was seeing, I just stared at it. And it was uh, right over the center of this pivot. So it was maybe 150 yards away from me and it wasn't 40 feet off the ground and it was a oval shape and the whole thing was a turquoise color but it glowed it was illuminated somehow and you couldn't see any details or any lines or anything but it just glowed a turquoise color and I watched it for several seconds. And then it was like I realized that I was watching it and it raised up in the air. So it was maybe 150 feet up in the air. And then it started moving across the sky to my left and gaining speed. It started really, really slow. And then it gained speed as it started going across the sky. And when it got halfway across the sky it was going so fast that it just disappeared and i don't know what was in that thing if it was people and that was some kind of technology that we don't know about or if it was alien but i do know that that was i've had my pilot's license since i was 19 and i since i was a little kid i could name every airplane in the sky and that is nothing that we have the the government's admitted to it's impossible with the way it moved and how fast it moved and the way it sat there with no noise at all that isn't anything that is supposed to be there so you see this thing and it's glowing it's not supposed to be there uh the experience is real for you uh what do you do with that? I mean, how do you compartmentalize that? I mean, it sounds like you don't believe that it was something that our military might have. Uh, what do you think about the UFO phenomenon and where these things are coming from? Do you think that they're all government? Some of them are government? What do you think? Well, that's a big question. I, <clears throat> I'm old enough. I don't care what people think about me. So I'm going to tell you what I think, <laughs> honestly. 
I don't think they're from another planet. I think the UFOs that people see are either built by the government or, and I think it's for a, a deception. I think it's a big deception that at some future point is going to play out and, and it's going to deceive a lot of people into taking a path that they shouldn't, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah, it makes sense a lot, man. Uh, you're not the first person to say that. I'm sure you won't be the last person to say that. And, uh, you know, it, it's really a big question mark for me personally. I mean, uh, the idea that these things being from another planet, um, people ask me if that would rock my faith. And I honestly don't I don't think it would, uh, because I just again, like I referenced earlier stuff, I, I just believe that th this world we live in is a very supernatural world. And I'm, you know, the creator of it, I don't think is any, I don't think anything's outside his realm of possibility. I, it doesn't mean I have to understand it for it to exist. And that's why I look at a lot of these things with a very uh, open mind about it. And I try to hear everybody's opinions and thoughts and how they view it, because uh, I, I just don't think anything is truly outside the realm of possibilities when you think on the level that I think on when it comes to uh, how we and all this has come into existence. Um, Dad, what do you think about that? I mean, do you think that uh, I, you saw UFOs before when you were a kid and stuff? Uh, and, you know, some of the some of his stories uh, or some of his experiences with this UFO were kind of similar to what you experienced and stuff. But uh, what are your thoughts on, you know, the whole UFO thing? Uh, you know, what are your what's your opinion on it? Yeah, I, I can see where, where Sam is coming from. I, I kind of have the, the same thought. You know, some of it, I think, is is uh, stuff that the, the military hasn't left out yet. You know, the things that they have. And and I think there's a, a, a portion of it, a part of it, or maybe even a large part of it or most of it uh, is, is a deception. I think at some point it's going to be used as a deception. It's a really good point. I, I think Sam makes a really good point with that because it's actually really interesting. It's an interesting thing to, 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 to think about, to postulate. I, I, I want, I'm trying to think of, of the the scientist who who had posed the question: If aliens exist, where are they? You know, there's there's no real hard evidence uh, of them. You know, even even now, I mean, we see things. You know, we see uh, lights in the sky. We see UFOs. Th things like like Sam saw. You know, just th that kind of stuff. And and yet, there's there's I don't know. You know, it, it's a good question because it's one of those questions that you scratch your head and you, you can formulate so many different opinions, so many thoughts on it. And it's like, well, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, because I, I'm 52 and I know what I saw when I was a kid and I'm still not sure. You know, I, I still don't have a, a solid answer for it. So, I, you know, it's an interesting question. It's an interesting question to pose, but it's a difficult question to answer. It certainly is. And, you know, when it comes to this idea of, you know, things, whether it's aliens, Bigfoot, ghosts, UFOs, break, whatever, the idea of being interdimensional, it throws a whole new twist into how you want to view things. It, it really makes you think if we're talking about something that is interdimensional, let's just say the UFO, let's just say the UFO is interdimensional, just throwing it out there. Um, it makes you wonder what's on the other side of that dimension that these things are operating in. You know, like one could say, well, um, heaven or, you know, a spiritual realm, uh, and that these things are operating within that. Um, but then again, we don't really understand what is on that other side because none of us have been there. And so, uh, I, I think that maybe even the other side, the other side, the realms I think could be definitely layered and uh have a lot more complexity comp what's the word i'm looking for Cl complexity <laughs> complex i can't I'm even now, try. I'm messing you up <laughs> let's just put it this way i think it could be a lot more complex. complexities sure whatever <laughs> <laughs> i think it could be a lot more complex than any of us give it credit for and uh i don't think that anybody's truly going to understand it until we're on that side now you can look at cern and what cern is doing and how they're discover they discovered the God particle. Theoretically, that's what we hear. And that uh, they did open up a door 
to another realm and that other things did come through, uh, that they've been playing with things they shouldn't be touching. But uh, that is theoretical because I don't think anybody at CERN has truly come out to say that, but more insiders leaking information. Um, But man, it's a rabbit hole. Once you start thinking about this stuff and you just start diving into it, you start connecting dots and you really start thinking, what are the possibilities? You know, and it's just that's why I like doing this show, just thinking out loud and talking with people. And uh, Sam, I've been talking to you all day, brother. So <laughs> <laughs> this has been a this has been a treat, man. I really do appreciate you sharing your experiences here on the confessionals as far as the paranormal goes. Uh, if you could, on the way out here, could you briefly give people a, a just a brief summary, not the, all the details, but just something brief of your out-of-body experience that you had in Iraq that you shared on Hammer Lane Legends? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. We, we drove mostly at night, <clears throat> and we were coming into Baghdad, and we missed, everybody in the convoy missed a turn. And we ended up in, in a really, really dangerous part of the city that we had no business being in. And I, I heard a voice next to me tell me that whatever the next move that we made would determine if we lived or died. And the next thing I knew, I was above my truck and I could see everything that happened uh, in 360 degrees around me, I could see Iraqis running with weapons to attack us. I could watch my friends in the front of the convoy. And we were able to get all of our trucks turned around. And for me being above my truck and being able to see the whole area, I was able to pick a, a safe route out of that kill zone and back onto a road where we would be safe and that long story short that was my experience in iraq yeah one of them yeah (laughs) long story very 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 short uh i'll tell you sam it's been a pleasure talking to you and uh your experiences in iraq uh your experiences here stateside uh it's been a real pleasure talking with you and i thank you for spending the evening with us sharing your stories on both shows well, it's been a it's been a pleasure for me too. I'm really glad I got to share those with you. I I'm glad I got to meet your dad, be the first one he interviewed. That's a real treat. And Brian, I thank you for for being here too. I appreciate that, Sam. I I really do appreciate everything. Just sitting here and talking with you today was just it was it was an interesting afternoon. It really was. And thank you so much for being willing to step up and share and uh, and being here for us and it, you know I, i'm glad that you were you were our first interview it was really cool i really enjoyed it and and i appreciate it so much and thank you again for your service even though it wasn't military service thank you for serving i, I appreciate that so much i really do thank you hey, tony i'd like to uh i have an email idaho unexplained at gmail and i would love for people to share their stories about the idaho desert and stuff that happened out here and put those together in one place for for reference or for future generations so if anybody has a story about the idaho desert and the stuff that happens out there i'd love to love for them to send me an email Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, please share the show with your friends. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok, email, water coolers. We don't care where you share the show. But if you enjoyed it, please share the show with your friends. And if you really did enjoy hearing Sam, you're definitely going to enjoy hearing his stories from overseas in Iraq as a civilian driver. Go ahead to Hammer Lane Legends right now and check it out. We have HammerLaneLegends.com and you can look for it in any of your app players. We are there waiting for you to listen. So go ahead and check that out right now. All right, guys, until next week, stay safe, take care, and remember, the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. Bye. threw open the driver's door, ran out the side of the car, across the front of it, and jumped right off the side of the bridge in front of me. 
The only people who really pulled over were truckers. He said, we're going to Hodge, and he didn't slow down. He went across the median onto the oncoming traffic, but where they could see him coming, they just got out of the way. I noticed this plane was really low. He went right in front of us, hit the fence, and it spun around. You know, 30 seconds more, he could have hit us. But I went around that truck, and a guy stepped out from behind the truck and threw a piece of wood, and it shot through my window just like a spear and stuck in the back of the cab of my truck. That's probably one of the stranger things I've seen. Hey, thanks for watching The Confessionals on YouTube. If you like what you heard, hit the subscribe button, hit the share button, and hit the like button. That would be a great help to me. And if you want more of The Confessionals on a weekly basis, every Thursday I come out with a special show just for members on my website. So if you want to check that out, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, and become a member today. And every Thursday, you'll get a new show, and you can binge on previous shows, which there's almost a 100 of them. So if you love the show, go ahead and check it out. But thank you very much for being here on YouTube and checking out the channel.